All right, welcome everybody to week three, how did that happen, of DES 242 logo and identity design. This mod is definitely flying by. I think it's because we're getting closer and closer to the holidays. And, you know, with the holidays, it seems like there's so many other things to do. So our mods are going to fly by as well. Um, but we are in week three. So let's take a quick peek at our agenda for this evening. I have a couple of announcements. We're going to be discussing the Gestalt principles, and then we're gonna talk about 10 principles of the Logo Design Masters, um, self-promotion via the web, and self-promotion via social media. And I also wanna pop in and take a look at our discussion question and our assignments for this week. So again, my telephone hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time, but um, the best point of contact with me is via email. Um, I try to get back to everybody as soon as I, as I can. I do work um, another job. I'm only, I'm only an adjunct here. Um, so, and when you are emailing me, please be aware of the time zone change. I am actually located in Eastern Standard Time Zone. Um, and... Let me, yeah, I'll go over the slide first. All right, so our due dates, and then I have a little blurb about those assignment redos. So all assignments and assessments are due by Saturday for full credit. Um, if your work is going to be late, please communicate with me. This will definitely save you some missed points. And the week four assignments cannot be turned in late. I don't have any control over this. The course will turn into a pumpkin and it shuts itself out. Um, the same goes for those quizzes um, for each week. I don't have any control over those um, the auto-correcting quizzes, when they close out, when they open, um, anything like that. So I just want to kind of let everybody know because a couple of people had some questions on the quizzes this week and I do not have control over the quizzes. Your original discussion post is due by Wednesday at midnight. Um, you need to respond to two of your fellow students by Saturday and post on at least two different days and late discussion posts will not be accepted past that Saturday deadline. If you miss the Wednesday deadline though, make sure you're getting it in because at that point you're only going to miss five points. So 55 points um, is way better than a zero for the week. And then assignment redos. I do allow one resubmission per assignment or assessment for a better grade. Those resubmissions must be completed by the Tuesday of week four, which is November 21st. I had an, uh, an announcement about that, but I just wanted to point it out because we're in week three right now. And discussions cannot be resubmitted. So please, if you had um, any assignments that you definitely want to redo make sure that you are getting those in um you know preferably this week so that way it's um you know you're not getting really close to that deadline all right, here's a little blurb about our course schedule and then a little note about my schedule. So our live sessions are Mondays and Tuesdays from 4 to 6 p.m. Mountain Time. This gives you ample time during the week to get those assignments done. Um, and if you do need any outside help, the Student Success Center is always available and there is no appointment necessary. And I will give you... Um, the hours for um, our learning coach as well um, when we get over um, when we get over into the course and then a little bit of a note on my schedule um, on during week four is Thanksgiving and it's that Thursday um, November 23rd of week four so I will be taking the Thursday and Friday off to be with my family for the holiday so um, if you do have any questions please get in touch with me earlier in the week um, you know don't wait until Saturday please make sure that you're looking things over ahead of time that's why I'm letting everybody know ahead of time that I am taking two two days off to you know I'm gonna be doing a ton of driving that day so I have foreseen my life being in the car unfortunately <laughs> um, all right so before we get into the gestalt principles let's take a look at our announcements in the course And 
If you haven't yet, don't forget to upload your finished logo um, from week two to your Behance portfolio and email me and your FPA after you've done this with the link. Um, you want to make sure that you're putting that work that you're doing each month up on your Behance portfolio because believe me, it'll be so much easier if you can do it now rather than after you finish school and you're trying to put everything together and get everything up there so that way you can send out your resume resume and try to get a job and it'll be one less thing you have to do. So, you know, definitely get into the habit during each month when you complete an, an assignment and you're really happy with the work, getting that work up there. Um, it will keep you nice and organized. It will keep all of your portfolio items together. So it's, it's a really good habit to get into. Also, um, our week three hours with our learning coach, DJ Smith. Our Monday, 4 to 9 p.m., Thursday, 7 to 11 p.m., Friday, 5 to 11 p.m., Saturday, 4 to 10 p.m. So some really good hours this week. So if you do need some extra help, um, please make sure that you're getting into the SSC. Um, stop by and see DJ. And one more announcement. If you need extra help with any of your writing, um, I posted a little flyer for the Writing Center. You know, if you want a second pair of eyes to review your discussion post, um, if you have a question about APA formatting, or if your word choice is strong, if you're not sure how to get started, the Writing Center is a great resource. They have live appointments um, available Tuesday to Saturday, and those appointments are private, which is you and a writing center specialist and no waiting your appointment time is your appointment time and then um, you can also um, submit your paper in the online system to get feedback within 24 to 48 hours so specify areas that you want feedback on such as APA formatting or sentence structure it's perfect for those students who can't make a live appointment so you know make the most of the you know all of these resources that are available to you guys I wish I had all these resources when I went to school online I think it's great. All right, so our discussion for this week. Keep going to click on week two, but we are in week three. We're going to be talking about designing a cohesive digital identity. So here's our background. Because we live in an increasingly interconnected digital world and it is assumed clients need a web presence, it is no longer enough to design a single logo, business card, etc. Rather, we must also be aware of how our designs can seamlessly translate into a digital environment. A digital identity often refers to how one is perceived on the internet. From websites to social media to professional networking sites, it is important to intentionally design and present a digital identity that is cohesive. As designers, because we help establish the visual identity of our clients, we also play a key role in helping our clients establish their own digital identities. For example, when visiting a company website with many pinks, reds, and yellows, viewers will feel the company has an upbeat, energetic digital identity. Conversely, when visiting a company website with many blues and grays, viewers will feel the company has a more formal corporate digital identity. Though it may not initially be in the scope of a logo design or redesign project, it is worthwhile to discuss how you as a designer can help a client consider and implement visuals in such a way as to best develop and maintain their digital identity across diverse digital platforms. Things to consider when designing are how the color scheme and overall logo message will carry over from the website to social media avatars, cover banners and graphics, how the perception of the logo will change from a large desktop computer screen to a small handheld mobile device. And I say this in all of my web, cl web classes. How many of you, you know, during the bulk of your day probably get on the web on your cell phone instead of on your laptop? I, I know I do. The only time I use my laptop is for work. The rest of the time I use my cell phone. So it's really important that, you know, things um, render correctly on a mo in a mobile platform. How color perception shifts when colors move from being seen on a printed page to being seen on a screen. How type perception shifts when type moves from being seen on a printed page to being seen on a screen. And our prompt. 
For this discussion, imagine a freelance writer looking for help designing a logo has approached you. They would like to use a logo across many diverse digital platforms, including a personal website, a personal blog, and several different social media accounts. They are looking for your guidance on what type of a logo design might work best and how to best create a unified message across so many digital platforms. They have never heard of the concept of a digital identity, but are very open to guidance and learning from you. Basically, they sound like they are the perfect client. <laughs> In approaching this task, how would you explain the concept of digital identity to them? Why is a cohesive digital identity important, and how might it help their freelance career? In approaching the design of their logo, what considerations must you make to ensure that you are creating a consistent look and feel across all platforms? Do you think it would be beneficial to steer them towards a certain type of logo, all typographic, all symbols, etc., or a certain logo orientation, vertical, horizontal, etc.? For your citation, you might use articles that show examples of create, creative social media design solutions. You can also find articles from experts that suggest the value of a cohesive digital identity to build trust. Your initial and reply post should work to develop a group understanding of this topic, challenge each other, build on each other, always be respectful, but discuss this and figure it out together. So this is our post for this week. We're going to talk about, you know, having a cohesive digital identity across many platforms. And you've probably seen this if you've been on a business website that, you know, even though they have Instagram and Facebook and a website, there is a cohesive feel across all of their social media, even though it's social media platforms and they didn't design the user interface of that social media platform. <laughs> So some things to think about. In our week three assignment, this is going to sound really familiar, this assignment. And the reason it's going to sound really familiar is it's kind of what we did in week one for our assignment, only this time we're designing for ourselves instead of a client. So our, um, our goal or our objective for for this assignment is to identify and apply three characteristics to produce a logo that encapsulates a unique identity and that unique identity will be yours. As a professional designer, others will often look to and hire you to create a logo and overall visual identity for them. Though excelling at this work is important because it allows you to have a, a sustainable career, it is important to occasionally turn your professional design eye on yourself. Designing or redesigning your own personal logo and ensuring your own digital identity is as cohesive and effective as possible. When considering the design of your own logo, it is important to first identify your own unique design story and the elements that set you apart from all the other designers in the world. This goes beyond just your favorite color or font to uncover the larger reasons you were drawn to design and your unique personalities. The following three questions can help you to discover what makes you unique and inspire you as a designer as you design your own personal logo. So these are some things to ask yourself. Why am I a designer? Why do I believe design is important? What is the thing that makes me unique and someone should hire me before they hire the guy down the street? Though the answers to these questions don't, have, don't seem to have an immediate visual translation to how you will design, with some critical thinking, they will enable you to build a strong foundation that is uniquely yours. For example, if you are a designer because you believe that beautiful ornamental design raises everyone's standards of living, then perhaps your personal logo will feature a flourish or scrolling element. If you believe design is important because it enables complex ideas and topics to be clearly represented to a wider audience, your personal logo might use a clean sans serif typeface such as Avenir or Myriad. If the thing that makes you unique is your love of illustration, your personal logo might contain a simple line drawing you've generated or some hand lettered type. So our prompt. For the final two weeks of this class, you will be designing a logo for yourself. So really put your time into this. I, this is great. This is a great, great assignment because when you're done and you're building your personal brand and you are building your social media presence for yourself as a designer, 
you'll already have your logo created. And that's a big piece of that puzzle. So really take the time this week and really put your best foot forward. This week, you, you will begin the preliminary design process and idea generation. In week four, you will finalize the logo design and show it in use within a corporate identity structure. So for our week three project, you will begin the preliminary design process and idea generation for your own logo. This should be very familiar as it's a very, it's very similar to the steps that you did for your week one and week two redesign project. This one goes into more depth because it's a new company, yours, that you are designing for. So first, spend time reflecting on those three questions outlined in the background above and write down your answers. Though it's tempting to immediately jump on the computer and begin trying new things, resist the urge and spend at least 10 to 20 minutes reflecting on your own why behind your choice to be a designer. You know, when you are sitting down and deciding, you know, that you are going to go back to school or you are going to go to school for the first time, why did you pick graphic design? as you know as as the uh, program that you wanted to get into it's been 20 years since i made that decision and i still know why i pick graphic design as the program that i want to get into so really you know start to to think through you know the the whole process that you went through you know step back to maybe two maybe three maybe even four years ago when you were looking at colleges and trying to decide what it was that you wanted to do what make made you say you know what graphic design i'm i am going to go to school for graphic design that's part of your why behind your choice to become a designer when you feel ready, complete 15 preliminary black and white sketches of possible logo concepts, considering possible font choices, imagery ideas, and even what name you would use. It doesn't have to be your, your own name. You can come up with a business name. You can use your, your own first and last name. You can use just your first name. You know, be creative. Um, it, it's really up to you what you want to name your company. When you feel ready, um, Oh, whoops, I already read that. Once you've completed your 15 sketches, choose three directions that you feel are most promising and create a further refined black and white version of each of these logos on the computer. So you can use the same exact process that you used in week one. You can either sketch them out by hand on paper and you know scan them in, take a, take a good photo. Um, you can sketch them out on the computer using, um, Photoshop using Illustrator, whatever you want to use to sketch. You can sketch them out in that Adobe Sketch program that I showed you that can be loaded on your tablet or your smartphone. Um, you know, in, if, you're, if you're out of the house a lot, consider putting that program on your phone. Uh, you know, it'll kind of give you something to do when, you know, to pass the time if you have a great idea and you're not home. Or keep a, a small notebook on you. And if you have a great idea, just sketch it out with a, you know, pencil and paper. Um, and, you know, take, take the best three and refine those. Do, do a really good revision. It'll help you in week four. So when you've completed all parts of the assignment, you will save your work as a multi-page PDF that includes the following, the answer to the three questions, 150 word minimum, a minimum of 15 sketches, and the three refined best logo directions from your sketches in black and white. When you're pu putting your answers to the three questions, make sure that you put your name somewhere on that document. Um, so that way I know whose is whose. Um, and you need to submit one multi-page PDF, so you'll do it the same exact way that you did it in week one. And for our assessment, we have a quiz. So again, um, this is on effective and ineffective logo design. Your quiz has no time so if you are unsure of a answer to a question, um, make sure that you are taking the time to um, research the answer. Um, 
before you before you select it, you have no time limit. So you can open up a new tab, you can open up a new browser window, you can Google if you're not 100% sure. You know, make sure that you're taking the time to, to research each question before, um, before you answer. And you'll be able to find all the answers by reading and watching the resources that are listed in the week three course media materials. And again, it's 15 questions, you have no time limit. So let me just open this up for you so we can take a look at what our week three course media materials are. And we'll scroll down to week three. There we go. So we have a PDF reading of the 10 principles of the Logo Design Masters. We have um, the Gestalt principles. I feel like I say that wrong. I should probably Google if I'm saying that right. Did you know that you can do that? You can do how to say. And it, it'll bring up, there is some YouTube video for apparently every single word. Gestalt or Ge gestalt, also gestalt. Gestalt. I, I do not say it as eloquently as she does. Gestalt. So you'll have, you can read up on the Gestalt principles. And then we also have a lynda.com playlist, um, which is on running a design business, self-promotion. So it looks as though you've got three, six, eight, ten, twelve, about 12, 15, 18, 21, so about like maybe 40, 45 minutes worth of videos. So before you take the test, make sure you go over all of the course uh, material for week three. Watch those lynda.com videos. Take notes because these are where the questions are going to come from. All right, so let's, um, let's get back into our slideshow and let's talk about those gestalt principles. I'm just gonna say gestalt because I'll drive everybody bananas if I'm trying to say it correctly with a correct accent. <laughs> so gestalt is a form of psychology that focuses on cognitive behavior, behaviors. Designers are influenced by the visual perceptual aspect of this, particularly the theory that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The mind copes with the visual confusion of our everyday world by consolidating objects into groups in order to simplify input. For instance, when our eyes see a tail, paws, legs, a body, fur, a collar, ears, and a nose, our minds bring these parts together to register as a cat, although it might also register as a dog. <laughs> the mind effectively simplifies the parts by making it into a single object. Applying this theory to design creates unity within a piece. The stronger the relationship between elements on a page, the better the communication. This theory also helps the designer influence the viewer by controlling how the design is viewed. So there are five design principles that are derived from the Gestalt theory. Proximity, similarity, con continuity, closure, and figure ground. Each employs different methods to create unity within the whole. Now, have you ever heard of any of these principles before? These five principles? All right, great. So it's always good when a concept isn't foreign. So we have proximity, that's our first principle. This refers to objects placed close together, being perceived as a group, but when they are spaced far apart, objects are perceived as being separate. So proximity occurs when objects are closer to each other rather than um, other, any other object. So as you can see, even just using the word proximity as an example here, you know, I know because I'm reading it as proximity that it's still, you know, part of a group, but if it was a word I did not recognize, if it was a word in a different language, I might not necessarily know that it makes up a word and that the letters aren't separate, as I would if I saw a, a word in a different language set up this way. I would assume this is one word. 
So proximity spacing can be as close as objects in direct contact or as far apart as opposite sides of the page. So even though these are far apart, they still have proximity spacing. It's just a bit different. The strongest proxim proximity relationship is when objects overlap because it leaves no doubt that those objects belong together. So it doesn't really matter in this example whether the circles overlap the squares or the squares overlap the, the circles. I understand that these two objects belong together, these two belong together, these two belong together, these two belong together. At no point am I confused about whether this dot belongs with this square based on this type of proximity. So using other design elements such as lines or shapes to surround objects also creates strong proximity. Lines and shapes can also link objects by passing through them or by underlining them. So here's an, a good example, I feel, of the use of proximity in a page layout. I know that this image goes with this headline, which goes with this body copy. Even though it's not, I didn't need to set it all up on one side of the page. There, each element anchors itself within the page, but there's still a cohesive line of proximity between the elements that tells me visually that they go together. Next, we have similarity. So shared visual characteristics automatically create relationships. The more alike objects appear, the more likely they are to be seen as a group. Note that similarity is based upon what an object looks like, not what an object is. So two dogs on a page do not automatically have similarity because they are dogs. One could be a Great Dane and the other a Chihuahua. Dogs that have very little in common. However, similarity would be created if both were brown and both were wearing red collars. So these two dogs, even though we still have a Great Dane and we have a Chihuahua, these two dogs feel like there is more similarity between them than this Chihuahua and this Great Dane. Isn't it funny how that works? So similarity can be achieved in many different ways, including size, color, and shape. Objects of a like size have similarity, illustrated by the fact that on a page filled with big circles and little circles, the mind will see all the big circles as belonging in one group, while all the little circles are in another, even if they are evenly dispersed on the page. Color and shape have the same effect. On a page filled with similar sized circles and squares in two different colors, the mind will separate them into two groups based upon color. And your mind probably did that with this image before I even read that sentence. You probably looked and said, oh, blue circles and squares. Oh, there's also red circles and squares. You didn't say there's blue and red circles. Oh, there's blue and red squares. Your mind tends to just group like things together. However, if the circles and squares are all the same size and color, the mind will group them all according to shape. So in this instance, we look and we say, oh, all right, there's six circles and there appears to be five squares. So what about this? What is the similarity that you can see on this page layout? I'll give a minute to see if anybody's typing in the chat, the text. What about the text? If you want to turn on your microphone, you can too, if that's a little bit easier. It probably is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> is this, you know, similar fonting for the body text and then similar fonting for the subheads? Right, right. And 
even like the headline and the subhead, you can tell that they're both the same exact font. They're just different sizes and they're both the same color, indicating that they are a type of headline, whether it be a main headline or be a subheadline. And then the body copy is all consistent. So this is why when we're designing um, a layout page, it's important that we have consistency and we use those paragraph styles for our text to, to maintain that consistency. So continuity, the principle of continuity dictates that once the eye begins to follow something, it will, continue, it will continue traveling in that direction until it encounters another object. So my eye started here and went right up this line until it hit the edge of my laptop screen and then it stopped, like it ran into the wall. And then it's um, at the same time started with this square and went right down and ran into that red line. So my eye began to travel in that direction until it encountered another object and then it slammed, you know, it slammed into that other object and it, and it stopped. So that's the principle of continue, continuity. A good example is a line with an arrow at the end of it. Um, this symbol indicates that a viewer should follow the line to the end to see what the arrow is pointing at, in this case, a dot. Symbols in objects that are similar to arrows, such as a hand pointing with a finger, are used frequently in design to create continuity, because we are literally at this point telling our viewer where they need to look. Other ways to lead the eye include a photograph or illustration containing an eye. A common design rule is that if an image of a person is used, make sure the person is looking toward the rest of the design. So in, in this instance, we have a dog, but the dog is looking right in on the article. So if he was flipped this way, pointing out, I wouldn't even think that he went with the article. I would think that he was probably an ad, a standalone ad for something else. But because he's looking into the article, I know it goes together. This helps the viewer move through the information instead of looking off the edge of the page, turning away from the information. A designer can also create a path through the page, either literally or figuratively. An image of a road, a path, a fence, a row of flowers, or a tunnel can all guide the eye across a page. For readers from Western cultures, the natural inclination is to lead the viewer's eye from left to right. Continuity gives the designer significant control over the viewer. The mind can't help but follow that path. So my eye goes like this. Exactly how it's supposed to. Then we have closure. Closure is related to continuity in that it asks the eye to complete a path. As long as enough essential information is present, the mind supplies the missing pieces of the object. So what should be in the middle of these circles? A star, exactly, a star. And you can kind of see it right here. Here it goes, and I know it's gonna go up here, and back down, and to there, and back up, and down, and over. So I don't actually need to supply that star in the center. I have enough information there to know that my viewer's eye will be able to complete that path. Closure works best with objects that are recognizable, obviously. <laughs> For example, an outline of a triangle that slowly has pieces taken away is still recognizable as a triangle, even when down to a bare minimum of pieces. Complex objects, however, are trickier for the mind to complete. And here's kind of a complex, um, one, uh, yes, exactly, <laughs> um, of the panda. So we, our eye can see exactly how the shape of the face should go right there and the shape of the back of the body. I think it goes like this. 
So the designer must strike a balance between what is taken away and what remains. The mind can't complete the object if too much of it is missing. So you can see where the A is starting to break down here. We have the full A and then we're starting to turn it into a checkered line, a little bit more of a dotted, dotted line, and then down to here. And that is one way that we can, you know, try to take away and use closure. But as you can see, this swoosh and this part of the A, I still know that this is an A. And, you know, which, which version do you think works better? The one with the star or the one with the dotted lines in the long run? Do you, is, is a better design and is a better um, use of closure? Right, the one with the star. So closure can actually be found quite often in paintings, mosaics, and sculptures throughout the ages. Classical artists have long recognized the ability of the mind to fill in those blanks. Especially when, when you say mosaics, I, you know, think of um, a mosaic you might have seen with like the glass tiles and you know how as you begin to step back, your mind puts all those tiles together to, to create that picture in your mind. Next, we have figure or ground. So the figure ground principle is based upon the relationship between an object and the surrounding space. So figure ground is also referred to as positive and negative space. The positive being the object and the negative referring to the space around it. So this principle gives the illusion of depth and is a fundamental principle used in almost every design. So figure refers to more than just imagery, type is considered figure as well. So in this instance, we have the same, um, the same photo of the dogs, we have the two columns of text, and we have our headline for figure. Now, this works because the white is running right into the white of the box, and it brings you right in. Do you think that this would be as striking if the word figure was up here, just in reverse? And the answer is no, because it, it, it wouldn't have that depth. You know, it, there is, this is definitely a great use of this where it's laying right on that line. And that's where using a grid and being extremely exacting in your design really pays off is in instances like this. And that's why this, this works. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. I had a eyelash in my eye. So again, figure ground can be used quite creatively when both the figure and ground form recognizable shapes at the same time. There are many examples of this one, one of the most common being the optical illusion of two opposite, opposing faces on opposite sides of the page with the negative space in between them forming a lamp, spindle, or other recognizable object. So remember, you probably saw this as a child, and somebody said, is it a lamp? Or is it two faces? And you, were, and, and you were probably asked that during class, and half of the class said, it's two faces, and the other half of the class said, no, no, it's a lamp. So, you know, the positive and negative space makes it both. Always a fun optical illusion to, if you ever teach younger children to ask them that question. Um, I used to teach um, K through eight art, and that was that was always a fun one. I would I would say, all right, never mind, raise your hand. And you know, whoever whatever side had the most, they'd be like, see, we have the most hands up. We're the ones who are right. And I would say, guess what? You're both right. I'd wait until the end and say, who thinks it's both? So, all right, 10 principles of the logo design masters. So these are the masters, uh, according to this list anyway, um, of people um, who designed logos. And these are their thoughts on that logo design. 
So the italics at the bottom is a quote from each person that I will be discussing. So number one was, ensure a thorough design brief is received. David Airy said that. So with logo design, the design brief is a valuable piece of documentation which directs the designer towards the correct goal. The logo brief has also, also helps me focus my attention on the areas that best serve your business, which is true. So this is something to get into a habit of with your clients is to put together a design brief um, and let you know, you know, tell me a little bit about your company. It's, it's for you to research and gather data on your potential clients. So, you know, what's the name of your company? This will be the name used in your logo design. Do you have a company tagline or slogan that you would like to be a part of the logo? What products or services do you sell? How many years has your company been in business? How many employees work for your company? So it, it kind of gives them an idea of, you know, what type of a company they are. You know, if they have 15 employees, they know they're probably a smaller mom and pop type business. And that matters when you're designing a logo. Number two, research the client's industry. John Sandrick said that. A comprehensive knowledge of the client's business and industry plays a key role in the creation of a logo that not only portrays the correct message, but also helps the client stand out in their sector. So because the company's name is Alliance and the capital A is a triangle and the triangle is the most visually stable shape, the stability is a key attribute in the insurance industry. I decided to focus on icons that formed the letter A. So you can see the icon there. Next we have use a sketch pad to quickly flesh out initial ideas by Denise Graveris. With computers being the center of all design in the modern world, it is often easy to get stuck in with the digital creation, although this sometimes results in a vague direction for the logo design process. Sketching out initial ideas can help you quickly consider and review various ideas. So it's really good to just carry a, 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 you know, a sketch pad with you. My husband for years used to keep a sketch pad at his desk and he sketched out all of his ideas. I mean, he didn't, and it wasn't always a professional sketch pad. Half of the time we worked for a company called Supercoops and they used to make these little bound books with the Supercoops logo on it out of scrap paper. And half the time, all of his best ideas were drawn out on that scrap, on those scrapbooks of paper. And then he would transfer them onto the computer later. But sketching, helps to evolve your imagination. Once you understand it, you always will start from just white paper. It is true, look at these sketches. You can come up with some really quick, quick designs. And here's the thing about a sketch too. Give yourself only a small amount of space. Like you can see how these are probably maybe two inch by two inch um, circles that this person is working in. And you really don't want anything that is more involved than what will fit into this two inch by two inch circle. That will be your best work and it will also be your, your best way to keep it simple. If you do a sketch on a whole piece of eight and a half by 11 paper, chances are you're going to get too detailed. It's going to not be a logo anymore. It's going to be more of a drawing because you have all that paper to work with. So it's easy to get carried away. Design the logo to work in a single color. Patrick Winfield. This is a great, great tip. Logos are used in, a, used in a huge range of environments, some of which require the logo to be reproduced at a small scale or in limited colors. Therefore, it is important to ensure that the logo design works in mono format. So, you know, if you are having a logo embroidered on the pocket of a tennis shirt or a polo shirt, you know, that logo is going to be small. It's probably going to be one color if it's being embroidered to save some money. So you need to make sure that that logo will work in that type of an environment. I will not even consider submitting color suggestions to a client for review until they have signed off on a final black and white logo. And that is a great tip as well. 
I couldn't find an image for Chris Spooner, so I used a picture that my husband <laughs> drew for this slide just to give him some credit here. So create the logo in vector format, Chris Spooner. Vector applications such as Adobe Illustrator create artwork based on mathematical equations, whereas raster-based applications such as Photoshop rely on underlying pixels of the document. In order for a logo design to be scaled without the quality of the imagery being affected, the logo must be in vector format. And the reason why I picked this image is because my husband specifically drew it so it looked like you had turned the... Um, Turn the image to outlines in Illustrator where you just see the line work. So that's how intricate his line work is on this, that this is the actual line work and that he overlaid another illustration on top of it in both a vector. So the logo must be scalable without losing quality. It needs to appear crisp or printed on anything from business cards to a 20-foot vinyl banner. Then we have present only the best concepts to the client. Angela Ferraro Fanning. Once a range of design concepts have been created, it's, it is time to select the best examples for presentation to the client for review. This stage is a halfway point in the overall process and determines whether the project is on the right track. So my question to you is, and you can turn on, again, if you wanna turn on your uh, microphone, you can feel more than free to discuss this with me. Why do you think we only want to show our clients a small selection of the examples that we've created? Why don't we show them, if we did, let's say we did 25 sketches, why aren't we showing them all 25? Why are we only showing them six? And if you don't want to type in the chat, it's okay. You can you can um, turn on your microphone again. I know it sometimes it takes forever to type it all out. I just came back. I didn't hear the the question was. Oh oh, I was saying. All right, so we're you know let's say that we did twenty five sketches um, in logo concepts for our client. Why would we only show them six? Why aren't we going to show them all 25? Even though we know that some of them aren't the best, but the, why aren't we going to just show them that we came up with 25 options? Because it's too many options? Right. Like, would you, believe me, exactly. Would you give a client that many options? It's insanely overwhelming to them. Because you know what they're going to do? they're going to sit on that for at least the next two months because there's so many to look at that they won't be able to make a decision. And they'll say, well, what if we take this part of this one, but we make it like this one instead, and then we take this color and make it that, and then maybe we add in the tree, before you know it, you've got a convoluted mess. So you really want to make sure that you've pared it down to the best of the best. And I honestly, I think six is a lot. I would, I think it's great how we do three. We do three that we kind of push a little bit further to see if they work. You know, it's important. Um, Angela Ferraro Fanning's quote is, it is important that I present clients with pieces that I feel happy about showing in my portfolio. And sometimes when you do 25 sketches, they're not all going to be great. You're going to have some duds in there. Right. Yeah, it, it, it happens. All right, number seven, show how the logo would work in context. So a logo can be used for a range of purposes from business stationery to vehicle graphics. So since the logo's main purpose is to fit on the cover of a magazine, I thought I'd present it to my client using a fictive cover photo. Depending on the cover illustration or photo, I thought of using the logo in either black or white. So that shows your client exactly how it'll work. They need a logo for a magazine. Well, here you go. And they sit there and they look at it and they say, I like it. I'm just trying to I'm trying to picture it on the cover of the magazine. If you show them the logo and then show them you know, a, a mock-up of it on the cover of a magazine, they get the visual and they can see it right there and go, ah, all right, it does work. I do like it. I, I am happy with this. 
And again, we say this every single week, pretty much. Use, you know, the KISS principles. Keep it simple, stupid. A popular principle in the world of design is the acronym KISS, which stands for keep it simple, stupid. The idea being to aim towards simplicity in a design rather than unnecessary complexity. So a refined and distilled identity will appear to catch the attention of a viewer zipping by signage at 70 miles per hour on packaging on the crowded shelves of a store or in any other vehicle used for advertising, marketing, and promotion. Because ultimately, you want your logo to be noticed and to stand out from the others. And if there's too much going on, a person isn't going to be able to tell, you know, what it is that you have. Number nine, make educated choices when it comes to color, Ryan Nichols. Color is one of the key aspects of any design. The psychology and impressions that each color gives can dramatically alter the message and overall appeal of a design. With logo design being closely related to presenting key values, color choice is of high importance. So we believe color is a very important communicator and contributes a lot to the tone and intended message of a brand. So for this logo, they have the Split Rock, rock Lighthouse, and I think that these two colors really work well together. You have the leaf and, you know, and a lighthouse. And you might say to yourself, well, a leaf should be bright green and the lighthouse should be black and red. And maybe, but there's something calming and soothing about these two colors together. And then number 10, rebrand with care. So we did rebranding for the last two weeks. That's what we were you know, looking at. Logos should be designed to avoid trends, making them timeless pieces of design that will look great today or years in the future. Examining their history, we found the store had used literally dozens of logos since its founding, and the store being Saks Fifth Avenue. Of these, one stood out, the logo drawn in 1973 by Tom Carnese, adapted from a signature introduced almost 20 years before. In many people's minds, this still was the Saks logo. And interesting enough, when I went online to look for the logo, in my head, this is what I saw as the Saks Fifth Avenue logo. And apparently, it's been redesigned dozens of times, and I did not know that because I think of the original iconic logo. But simply reinstating a 30-year-old logo wouldn't be enough. Saks was happy to emphasize its heritage, but it was even more eager to signal that it was looking to the future, a place of constant change and surprise with a consistent dedication to quality. So there's a, it's very subtle. The difference in the logos. Mm, where's that image? I showed all of them. Here we go. So we had Saks Fifth Avenue, Saks Fifth Avenue. This one's not so great. Saks Fifth Avenue, which is still the same font as down here. And down here, then we had Saks Fifth Avenue here, and almost back to that 1973 layout, you'll just notice it's just a little bit thinner, which makes it a little bit more modern. But I bet, you know, if I don't, I don't necessarily shop at Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, so, I don't really know the answer to this, you know, but I don't remember seeing this logo. I wasn't around for these ones, obviously. I just remember this logo and I thought it was the same exact logo. I really, really, truly did. So when they went back to it, you can see just, you know, how they've really just kind of thinned it out. And this was, you know, not that different, just placement. So, interesting evolution of that logo. All right, so now would be a good time. We're gonna take a quick break and then I will 
pop into Illustrator to kind of just show you some of my thought process for coming up with a logo design for myself. And I'll show you um, a logo that we created for our personal um, design company. Um, so why don't we just take maybe a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. Um, does that sound good to you? Works for me. All right, great. I will see you in 10 minutes. Okay. Set a timer for 10 minutes.
Alrighty, so hopefully we are back and we can jump back in. The high zoom, it takes up like half my screen. <laughs> All right. Oh, and it is freezing here tonight. All right, great. You're back too. All right. So let's hop over into Illustrator. So um, I'm just going to make a five by five document um, with three, I'll do four, four artboards. Um, just, you know, to quickly come up with some ideas on, um, you know, some personal logos for myself. There we go. Like I said, I, I feel like I mainly work in art boards for you guys. I really hate working in art boards. I'm not going to lie. I said that, I say that every single time, but it's not, it's not one of my best, I, you know, the, my favorite ways to work in Illustrator or Photoshop for that matter. But I, I understand. I understand that's the, the new hip way you kids are doing things these days. So, you know, I work in art boards for you. All right. So some of... You know, when I'm thinking about myself as a designer, um, I like to think of my designs as, you know, being, I, I, I believe in clean design, um, but if something, you know, like things are lined up with a grid, things are where they, um, oh, nice, nice. Things are lined up with the grid. Things are where they, they should be, you know, there's, you know, there's proximity. I, I really believe in the gestalt principles. Um, but at the same time, I want to put my personal signature on my design. And I feel like there's a couple of different ways that I, I tend to do that in the way that I design things. Um, so when I start to think about my own personal logo, you know, I think of my logo kind of as a signature, but my signature, like my own personal signature is extremely messy. And if I sign something, um, half the time they're like, is that a scribble? And I just say, yes, <laughs> you know? So clearly I would not use my actual signature then, as I am not a famous person, as my logo. But I like the idea of doing something along those lines. So I'm going to start to look at some script type. Oops. Where's my, where is my character tool? There we go. Let's, let's drag this bad boy out. And I like this, how you can separate out your fonts now. So I can take a look and see what I have for different script fonts available on my um, machine. I kind of like this Alina Bold. I kind of like the Alex Brush. I'm not a big fan of almost kind of, I, I, it, I don't really know another way of putting it except for like kind of like girly fonts, even though fonts don't have a gender. So, uh, but something like, like kind of like bubbly, uh, that, that's not, that's not really me as a designer. I, I think it's more, kind of fast and fast, and, not fast and crazy, but I, I don't know. All right, let me type out my name and then we can go, I'll go through a couple of different fonts. And again, you can come up with a business name. You don't have to use your actual name. I'm just going to, I'm going to use my actual name. So I like that I can kind of just run my mouse over it and it will show me Different fonts, new, 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 no, new, never, new, no. Randomly enough, now that I see the Elena Bold, I'm not a fan of the kind of broken look of that, and I'm not a fan of not a fan of the S in Alex Alex Brush. Um, no, maybe, maybe, let me make that one, make a copy. Right, yeah, 
More th- thin. I'm a fan of thinner, I think, script font. So where was I? Hummingbird. So that is not Lakeside. No. No. You will see there are more fonts I don't like. <laughs> That's a little crazy. Kind of like where that's going. Copy and that's interesting. It's got no letters. No, new, new, double no, triple no, no. Let me see. There's got to be. Let's go to. Let's try to find a couple of script fonts on Typekit. So I want script. I want it to be my name. So I'm going to type my name up at the top and we'll see what I see. That's kind of. Oh, if I favorited this and I didn't download it, I wonder if there was a reason for that. Like maybe it doesn't, it's not available for print. It's only available for web. Sometimes you run into that. Oh no, it's there. All right. Let's add it. Let's add it while I'm thinking because it's going to take forever to sync. Doo -doo. That's kind of cool, but I feel like that almost looks like an L. So I'm not, you know, I want people, I want to make sure that people know that it's my first name. So if they can't make out that letter, that's not really going to work. Black Sword. Is that from um, Typekit? Oh, default.com. Yeah, I've used that before too. I also like Font Squirrel. If you've, Folk Squirrel has really good fonts as well. You have to download them, but, um, and you can separate it out by classification as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll take a look over there as well. And I believe it lets you preview. It does. Test drive. There we go. Eh. Go back to Typekick just because it'll be a little bit easier. That's a little crazy. That kind of looks like a signature, but not really what I'm going for. That could be cool. So let me sync that one while I, oh, nope, no syncing. It, it could be cool, so you have to buy it. Obviously, that's how it always works, doesn't it? Let's see about this one. A hundred dollars for that font? That's just crazy talk. Fonts are so expensive. But I mean, I get it. If I went through all of the work of designing a font, my fonts would be one million dollars. That's what I would charge. Uh, and nobody would ever buy them. <laughs> I'd be like, do you know how long it took me to work on this? These fonts are one million dollars. Eh, no. Too much going on there. That kind of looks like handwriting as well. And also for sale. Oh, I bet you if I hover, it tells me. There must be a way to sort by... Down here, it's, are these all in your plan? Oh, okay. Um, maybe. You can download this version? That makes no sense, it's not even the same font. The free ones are, none of these even look the same. 
What kind of weirdo system is that? All right, I'm over, I'm back over to Font Squirrel. That was that got a little bit crazy. Let's check out some script fonts over here. Just so I can show you at least downloading something from Font Squirrel as well. Mm. Eh, no. That could be cool, so I'll just download it. That's a little too crazy. A little too crazy as well. I'll try that one. All right. So let's see these two that I downloaded, because this is a little bit of a different way. Drag them over into week three. And what you're going to do is you're going to unzip them if you find anything on Font Squirrel. Just unzip them. Delete out those zip files. And where you see the OTF file or the TTF file, open type font or true type font, open it and just click install font. And same thing for the other one. And quickly in Lover's Quarrel. All right. And my other fonts from Fontbook will probably sync in 76 hours. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see. Fonts. I don't even remember what I looked for. But I can switch it out with this one. So I did. It's not showing up. Why aren't you showing up? Quigley. Oh, I know why. Min. I need to go to all classes. There it is. Um, that S is a little crazy. Crazy good, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and the other one was Quigley. And Quigley I'm not that, I'm not that fond of, but for this I'll just leave it. All right, so I'm gonna move, I'm gonna put them in order of, of how I like them. So I like it in this order, one, two, three, four. All right, so if I don't get to this one, it's fine because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that font. All right, so I'm gonna start to look at the scale of different letters. Like I might make the S a little bit bigger. Maybe show all my options. There we go. Move this up a little. Um, maybe move the O in a little, just a smidge. It's good. Maybe move the A in a little smidge. And I want to do my last name in a very thin serif font. Or maybe I'll just do Shannon Design. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm torn between doing my last name and doing um, design. So I'm going to look at come, some of my options for a sans serif font. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to type out my, my last name. Whoops. Not on the same. <sighs> Mm. 
Not in that font. That's way too much of that font. Me Mians Premium was added. Maybe it's a little bit better than this last one. All classes. There we go. Mayans Premium. Eh, 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 I'm still not a fan. Maybe I, I'm just hoping I never get to the square. All right. So let's see. Some sans serif fonts. No, no. I also need to make my that name smaller. Once I get it out of a script font. Acumen Pro Condensed Thin. That's an option. Option one. Um, no, no, too bold, not tall enough. I like the, how tall that is, too tall, no, um, Futura definitely has an option. Futura Light Condensed, that's an option. And I'm not a huge fan of Gil Sands. I know that that's basically blasphemous to say as a graphic designer, but Gil Sands is not one of my favorite fonts, and I'll show you why. Whenever I type my name in Gil Sands, I don't like I don't like this that happens. I don't I don't like the A's of Gil Sands. I'm just not a fan of Gil Sands. I feel like it's a little it's a little too much. Nobody else agrees with my assessment on that. So <laughs> I know that I'm I know that I am on my own in that thought. Proxima Soft Light. That's kind of an option. Kind of all over the place with these sans serifs. Treed Gothic. Do I have the thin version of this? Bold? No. And bold contents. No, I do not. Um. Hmm. That might work too. All right. So I am going to drag a copy of this out here and I'm going to turn this one to outlines because otherwise the text is going to get in the way. And I kind of like, I kind of like my first option that I went with, with this font, but that doesn't mean that one of these three might not go with one of the other ones. So I'm going to kind of leave them over here and let them stew and let me think about it. Um, <laughs> You're tolerant of papyrus? I am not tolerant of papyrus either. <laughs> not, there's a couple of fonts I'm just not tolerant of. <laughs> so it happens. I've I have I have called myself a self-proclaimed uh, font snob. I it's a badge that I wear proudly, but it's one of those and I get it, it's everything, it's a personal decision. It really is. So, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Maybe I could do something like this. McNamara design. Um, just kind of spitball in here. Acumen Pro. Black becomes design. I don't know. Or I can do Shannon Mac designs. That might be a better way. Something like that. And I'm gonna group these for now. Yeah, 
yeah, it is a little modern, kind of, kind of like that. I feel like this S needs to be really, really pronounced. Mm. Can you make the S really big and like the rest of the word for Shannon go like inside that top loop? Um, I mean, I could, but I don't, I don't know if I, I don't think I would necessarily like that because once I get it smaller, you're not going to be able to see what's going on in here. That's true. So that's one thing I gotta consider. Um, so again, these are sketches. So I'm gonna kind of leave this one. I'm gonna kind of let that one stew for a minute because you know they're sketches. I don't want to get too too involved with it. Um, so let's see this one. I the funny thing is is I like the H A N N O N. I'm not that crazy about the S. I feel like what is going? There's so much going on with this S that I'm wondering. If you can clean it up a little, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Like, if I can kind of because that loop look like it can disappear, yeah. If I start to kind of mess with it, that's what I'm wondering. Let's see, bye. We're all about this. Figure out where it should close. Uh, close it there, close it there, close it there, close it there. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Yeah, there's a whole lot going on. But I think I might be I think I might be able to pull it off. Let's see. I forgot all about this option. Yeah, I mean if you're making a logo, you know, you can definitely I wouldn't skew a font. Um but taking stuff away. Yeah, yeah, but taking stuff away, yeah. Definitely. Let's see. The line oops. Should go. Like that's not even Yeah, it looks like it's too much. Let's all right. If I was drawing this, how does it sometimes you have to kind of figure out how where the line goes so you gotta find the curve of the line and i don't i don't think it was actually just see what i mean they don't meet up on a curve you can get the curve right there and then oops, you can get the curve over here but i just need to zoom out a bit all right, so if I was drawing this, I would go like this. Go to probably here. That looks like it works. And to here. Something's getting lost in the in this area on the curve. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I don't know. Plus the fact that it's just a sketch right now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I would I would probably end up redrawing this S completely to... Because I started thinking about this one for myself with the fact that most S's and fonts I'm not really... Uh, well drawn, yeah. <laughs> They, they're either like really crazy and they go all out or they don't seem to match the rest of the font. Right. I'm and, already, yeah, I'm already in the process of thinking this thing through and I'm probably about 30 typical designs in. Oh, nice. And you're in the same boat as me with the, the first name with an S. <laughs> yes. Let's see, where else? Oh, the, wait, all right, hold on. So the S would go like 
so I need to cut off here and so it's just like it's this crazy loop yeah it, it's this yeah it really is it's like they went really nuts for some reason with this s and now I gotta fix it <laughs> I gotta fix their craziness all right um, I can't even like follow it in my head. Here we go. All right. Wait a minute. Nope. I closed off the wrong part. Hold on. Hold on. Close up this line. Okay. I just need to see this. So we need to do 15 sketches. Yep. 15 sketches and then refine three of them. That's a lot. Uh, That's like you can you can sketch them out on paper, you know. I mean, there's you know you don't have you don't have to and you don't have to do all fifteen on paper. You could do fifteen sketches. You could do you know yeah. maybe eight sketches on paper and seven of them, you know, an illustrator or you know vice versa. You you can break it up to whatever ends up being the most comfortable for you. I have a well, I have a lot of ideas. I just have to now sit down and buckle what I want because um, I have a logo. Okay. That I'm actually using. Does it, does the 15 sketches necessarily have to be the same thing? No, you can have all different ideas. I, I, mean, part, I think part of, um, I think part of it is figuring out, um, you know, what you want for a company. Right. So definitely take that opportunity um, and, you know, come up with, you know, maybe some of them have your name. Maybe some of them have, um, you know, have a design name. Uh-huh. It's, it's really up to you you know how you want to do those um 15 sketches like how you know it can be part of your your process of coming up with a name i'm okay with that okay yeah definitely let's see all right <laughs> it's coming together, right? <laughs> oh, no. Oops. What did I do wrong here? Why? Oh, I'm missing a line somewhere. All right, so, oh, and this one. <laughs> so that's, I mean, this is, this is a little bit better of an S, I guess. Cause I like how this I like how this is drawn. Like the O was on its own. And needs to come over too. Come on everybody, get together. And which of the McNamara's am I going to use? Maybe something like that. Maybe with design running underneath. Ebeneer, 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 where are you? Black. Hmm. 
make this monstrosity a little bit bigger. Um, oh, I didn't put, I didn't do my offset path demonstration this time. All right. This is a good demonstration. If you want to put a border on something, which normally I'm not really keen on borders, but I understand that people want to use them. Do not use the border tool. And I'm going to show you why. So here I have put a bright pink, come on. <sighs> a bright pink, really? That's white. I clearly selected pink. There we go. Border. And now it's gray. Am I in like grayscale here and I'm not like file? Color mode. No, I am not. I'm not <laughs> gray. What is going on? Why isn't it showing my colors as colors? What about this? No. No. Really? That's what we're doing now? All right, that's showing as a color. That's showing as a color. This makes zero sense. All right, well, we'll pretend that my border was a color, because it should be. No idea what is going on with my Illustrator palette right now. Anyways. So I use I did a border, which would be easier to see if it was actually showing it in a color and not in grayscale. Um, I really don't know why I did this. Okay. So very bizarre. Anyways, so you can see as it shrinks, the border consistently creeps in on my color. So by the time my logo is really small on a business card, my border color is like more prominent than my actual color because the borders don't scale correctly. So you may be thinking, but I want to use a border, so how do I fix this? And I will show you. Right. So, after you have turned your font to outlines, what you will do is you will go to Object, Path, Offset Path. And you can preview it. And you're going to put an offset path around the object. So make it this big. And then you would change the inside color, not the border color, you would change the inside color. And this time it's working at least. And then when you scale it, you will notice it scales proportionally, no matter how small you go. The border scales proportionally, it's not creeping in on the color. So offset paths are the only way to do this, basically. What if you wanted to do, and I, I've been seeing this a lot when I start looking at other designs, like people who put that big like border around just the outside of the um letters where it's not like it's like around the entire letter but around the entire shape oh i see what you're saying so um it kind of like like this runs into the e which yeah like everything would be S. together and then it's like around the shape instead of every letter Right, you can, I mean, you can use an offset path, path to do that. Um, hold on. I really need to figure out how to get rid of that Lorem Ipsum object, uh, um, option, it drives me bananas. <laughs> All right, so if you went and you did path offset path, and you made the offset path like really big, so point, maybe even point oh two five. Maybe point oh nine five. We're getting there. Point one five. That was too big. Point one four. I mean point one two five. Yeah, a little bit too big. Point oh nine five. 
you know, something like this, but it, um, that would be one way to do it, see? Uh, and then send it to the back. And then you can just kind of manually go in and fill in. Well, uh, so offset path will kind of do that for you. I mean, you might have better luck drawing it. You might have a better, you know, a better flow to it, but at least you can kind of get the general shape with an offset path. Right. All right, so there's, there's that one. I made a mess of that S. There's that one. All right, then we have this one. My only problem with this is... The swoops. Yeah, there's too many of them. And I'm wondering if I can alter that a bit. I've tried that once. It didn't turn out. Really no, good. it's not. It's not. Yeah. There's so many lines. Like if, all right, look at what happens when I select it with the whites. Look at how many lines, uh, points there are. Right. In I try to like shrink it by like trying to convert the loops and bring them in. And yeah. Look right. Yeah. No, that happens. So, uh, oh, I already, I already know what font I'm going to use. It's up here. I'm going to use Futura for this one. Get down here, Futura. Good. Path, offset path. Nope. When you went to do the offset path, did you go to type? Nope. Um, object. Object, okay. Yep. Oh, and I meant to do that as yes, white, not gray. Select same fill color white. I'll leave these ones because that's a good line. This one was not. <laughs> And very, very exact. There we go. All right, so that one's not that bad, actually. I think that takes away from a lot of the swoops going on. Um, and then this one, oh, I'm just, I just can't find a fourth script font it feels like i'm still gonna, I'm gonna leave that one i feel like i want to do something with this like turning into the dot on the eye i think that'd be kind of cool when if you use the reverse like for your fourth one you do a reverse you use design in a script and your name as a kind oh of that's a good idea yeah let's let's try that That's actually not bad because that looked like a capital D and a lowercase D. Yeah, it does. I like how it kind of goes into the E. Need to move ugh, the S a little bit closer, though. Oh, I don't like how it does that, though. Like, I almost want the I to do something like, I don't know. Like, like, meet up with the N, which <laughs> would be kind of weird. <laughs> hmm. Be like, like the, I don't know. But I do feel like I need, I need my name in there. So maybe in 
I'm gonna try Avenir. Oh. Not black. Light. No, not Avenir. What did I use up here? Oh. For Mac. Oh, I don't remember. Let me bring this one down. I already have this one. Down here. Maybe Mac, Mac design. Maybe Mac is on a curve. I don't know. Right. That one's interesting. Hmm. Hold on. Let me make a copy of this. Um, hmm. Oh, this thing. I don't need a tour of, of Illustrator. Although maybe I do, because can you tell me how to get rid of the lower mipsum? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me turn this up. Copy over first. Turn that to outlines. Lock that. I'm going to get rid of the dot. Um, not, not necessarily that effect. Let me see. Oh, no. Copy. Brass. Right. Outline. Um, mm. I wanted to, um, Arch a little bit. That's what right. I would the bottom of the curve as well. Maybe not as much. Get that one out of here. I hate how you can't see. You only see like what it looked like before. <laughs> right. A little bit closer. Mac design. I feel like I feel like it needs something. Hmm. Like maybe the bottom of an apple. Like, I mean, I like the eye without the dot. Yeah. People think of it as an E. Right. I don't know if it's just, like, I like this part of the font, but I'm not crazy about the rest of the font. Like, I like how the D goes into the E, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sold on the rest of it. When is, this is just a crazy idea. So just looking at that last one. So instead of design all being the same font, since the D and the E looks nice, when if sign was a, like, and this may be going into that too many fonts thing, but if sign was in another font. Yeah, I don't know if that would work because it's in one word. Right. Like, I'm almost wondering at that point if you hand letter something and then draw out the rest yourself and then try to mimic this, but maybe go into an S that goes like this. Yeah. Because then you took the top part of the S off and made it look like a lowercase cursive F, that actually looked like it'll work. Yeah, maybe. 
I, uh, no time to hand letter it during this uh, during our live session, but that is a, that is definitely you know it's definitely a thought. I think out of I'm not even sure at this point out of the three. I kind of like what's going on up here. I just want to add a little bit to it. This one feels like too much. I like this one, and this one just feels like it's 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 going somewhere. I just don't know where that somewhere is yet. <laughs> I mean, I like number one. I like number two. There's that there's that hump on that S that it looked like was forgotten. Yeah, it was forgotten. I gotta take that off. I think when I, I scaled it, it the white part went somewhere else. I didn't yeah, have it. Yeah. I would say because two is uh, two is interesting. Yeah. I'm actually crazy enough to say that I like number four if it was worked a little different. Yeah, it definitely needs a ton more work. It's um it's definitely in the very basic sketch um sketch phase at the moment. But that's what we will do tomorrow. So before we end today, I just wanted to show you um this is the logo that we had come up with for our business. So we decided to call our business Pixel 8. So when you think of an image in Photoshop and it starts to get pixelated, that's where we came up with the name. So when we were coming up with um, drawing it and the font and everything, we wanted it to look as though the font started to pixelate. And then we came up with this icon, which is a square with the two, um, the two squares in it, but it actually makes an eight. Turned on its side. And it works well um, across all of our um, online platforms. So here we have it here. We have a couple of different iterations, basically, of this logo. Um, there's a one with the Twitter bird behind it. Um, there is one on YouTube. Um, and then we have one on Facebook as well. So, you know, the, those were the things we had to think about. Is it going to work across all of our platforms when we make, you know, when we, when we use this logo, is it going to work on a business card, which it does. I can, oh, I probably, it'd probably be easier for me to show you it here. I have a copy of our business cards in my portfolio. <laughs> I started to look at people's Behance sites and they started showing like scales of their business cards and things like that too. I thought I had it there. Maybe I don't. Oh, it's on my Behance site. But you know, these were all the things I had to think about. Like where are all the different places that this logo is going to be used? And um, it was my husband and I who came up with um, this logo. I want to say it's in here. It's, I did a long time ago, so, you know, Behance puts everything in order that you uploaded it, so it's probably, like, way down at the bottom, if it's even on this page. <laughs> oh, here it is. So, this is um, the front of the business card and the back of the business card, and we reuse the eight, you know, for different different things. Yeah, I got to get, this is what, I like that. Thank you. So, you know, just some things to think about when you're putting it together is, you know, what, well, I got to use this on a lot of different things. So is it going to work well on a business card size? Because that's small. Is it going to work well on a website? You know, is it going to, um work well on you know a facebook page etc etc you know inside of the square of the facebook page and then i need to set up a cover photo so these are all um you know these are all the different things that you really need to think about when you're creating these logos but anyways that is all that we have time for tonight so hopefully tomorrow oh and i should probably save this um File, same as week three.
logo concepts. You would name it correctly. Well, I'll get a little bit back into this tomorrow. I'll try to work some more of these sketches. Um, but if anybody has any questions between now and then, please feel free to email me. If you have any outstanding work from weeks one and two, please try to get that in as soon as possible. So that way you can really put your focus on designing your brand this week, because I think that this will be an assignment that you guys will definitely have some fun with. Um, and thank you so much for coming tonight, and I hope I see you guys tomorrow. All right. All right, have a good night. You too, see you tomorrow. All right, bye. Good night, have a good one. You too.